Shut up and sit down. Welcome to True Crime Groove. I'm your host, Mays. And with me, as always, is a woman who thinks that my life would be much better if I just shut up and listen to everything she tells me to do. My good, <laughs> my good friend, Tex. How are you doing today, Tex? I'm doing fine. That's correct. <laughs> I know. I know. <laughs> I wanted to thank everyone for listening to the podcast today. Uh, the channel is growing a little bit at a time, which is just fine with us. We don't we don't mind steady as she goes. Uh, we I want to give a special thanks to our 170 subscribers. If you're listening now, if you could go ahead and click that subscribe button, we would really appreciate that. Um, we left off last time, I think, talking about, well, we had identified the victims the eight murdered girls. We had talked a little bit about uh, some of the corruption in the in the sheriff's office there in Jeff Davis Parish, and we had gotten into a few other things, a local drug dealer and this and that. Um, so if, if you could go and you haven't heard parts one and two, please go listen to those. We would really appreciate that. But we, we had a little more to talk about because the the corruption and some of the misdeeds they go they go just a little bit higher than just the sheriff's department and uh, so we we had a little more to talk about with this case so without further ado let's get get on to that this is true crime groove let's get our groove on and talk some true crime this is the jeff davis 8 I think where we left off, Tex, uh, we were discussing the pros and cons of sleeping with your own cousin. Is is that correct? <laughs> no. <laughs> no. Oh, okay, I, I, I'm, I don't think so. I, I'm off there, I, I think. Where did we leave off? Oh, we're going to go to a lovely place called the Boudreaux Inn. At the Boudreaux Inn... Uh, they had gambling. Of course, they served alcohol. Louisiana, every place serves alcohol. To get a, a gambling license, the uh, the standards are very high. As and it's also with the uh, the alcohol. If if you get caught with an underage person drinking, you can lose that license. Okay. So you have to be really really careful. However, this well, the, the Boudreaux at, Inn, just just about everything was going on at the Boudreaux Inn, right? Right. I mean, so se- sex, drugs, right? G- gambling. Had, yeah, they had um, they had a list of complaints and problems at the Boudreaux Inn that was incredible, with you know people being shot, um, all kinds of things, fights, all sorts of things. However. Never lost their license. Never lost their gambling license. Never lost the license to uh, have alcohol on the premises. So that's that's, an, that's part of Louisiana politics. That's that's a neat trick. Yeah, you uh, you have to know someone to keep a place like that going. You just can't, you know, say, "Oh, okay, well, you know." They look the other way. It's a look the other way situation. There's a lot of that in uh, Jeff Davis. Evidently. Uh, there were some powerful people behind the Boudreaux Inn, evidently. If to do something illegal and get away with it, you have to be able to make a phone call. That's all there is to it. So when Ethan, Ethan Brown, who did the book um, Murder in the Bayou, he started to research 
the Boudreaux Inn, he found a man who went by the name of Big G. And the people there called him the poker man because he would come around once a week and collect all the money from the poker machines. Uh, they said, you know, he was kind of, he could pull his weight if he wanted to. Um, so he went on and found out that his, uh, the G stood for Gilry, which isn't a big help because Gilry is a very pop, you know, there's a million Gilrys. So that didn't help. First name was Martin. So he went and looked at the lease for the Boudreaux Inn. And lo and behold, Martin Gilry is on the lease for the Boudreaux Inn. And uh, so Ethan Brown called him. He denied any allegations, you know, said he knew a couple of the women there, uh, you know, that had died of the Jeff Davis eight. Uh, all of the most all of those women uh, went there. It was the it was where people went for drugs and for sex. Everyone in town knew that if you wanted drugs or sex, you went to the Boudreaux Inn. You could, you know, get it there. But uh, this man, and he got irate with Ethan Brown um, when it came down to it. You know, he finally told him, he said, I don't know what you're after, but, you know, you can forget it. You're not going to get it, and we'll, you're going to wind up getting sued. And don't talk to me anymore was basically how the conversation ended. Well, who's pulling this guy's strings? Well, yes, that's where it gets a little bit interesting. Yeah. Uh, have, you, have you ever seen the show Ozark? You watch Ozark? No, I don't. Okay. It's, it's just reminding me a little bit because uh, it's, it's a show about a guy. He's, a, he's an accountant, but he's cleaning money for the cartels. And um, he goes to the Ozarks to get away from some trouble he's in, and he starts cleaning money there. And he, that's what he did. He, he uses some casinos and things to clean, oh. clean money. Wow, it, it's a good show. I, I recommend it. I recommend it to our listeners if they're uh, if they're if Sounds good. interesting. Yeah, it's pretty good. Yeah, well, of course, Frankie Richard's name comes up all through this story. He also gave uh, Ethan Brown tips. They, you know, he would call him and he would give him little tips. And so Frankie Richard told him, "You might want to look into Charles Bustani." He was a U.S. representative from 2005 to 2017 uh, in Louisiana. He was a congressman. He also ran for Senate in 2016. So Ethan found out that Martin Gilry had a phone number on uh, to Capitol Hill. So he was um, employed by Charles Bustani, and he had a he was on the lease to the Boudreaux Inn. So now we have, possibly have, Charles Bustani connected to the Boudreaux Inn. There was a relative of Nicole Gary, she was the eighth victim, said that, that Nicole had passed uh, yard signs for Charles Bustani. And Nicole p actually pointed him out as someone that she knew from the Boudreaux Inn. That, that Nicole knew Charles Bustani not because he was a congressman, not because he was running for U.S. Senate, because of the Boudreaux Inn. He was, party he was partying at the Boudreaux Inn? That's what they implied. Okay. Um, also, Kristen Lopez, the third victim, it came out that she had had sex with him, um, that he had paid her, they argued. That had come out. He's vehemently denied everything they rumor, always do yeah yes rumor has it that uh, the first victim Loretta Chason Lewis was one of his favorites that came from Frankie Richard well they all cut they all really liked Loretta all, all of them did yeah so she was she was a pretty girl she was she was an attractive woman so Right. The, Ethan had asked Martin Gilry about Charles Bustani and him working with him in 2005. And if Bustani ever went to the Boudreaux Inn and Martin Gilry just was like, why would he ever go there? Why would he ever associate with any of them girls? You know, 
what are you talking about? And he flat went a little bit crazy on the phone and said, um, you're going to have a lawsuit for sure. You know, this is when he told him flat out, we're done with the conversation that we were talking about earlier. Then it came out in the Washington Post. They ran an article about a new prostitution scandal in the Louisiana Senate race. So here it comes, and Bustani, he says, well, this is just politically motivated. It's all politics, and it's completely wrong. He denied everything, and he said that uh, he was going to fire Martin Gilry, but but Martin Gilry resigned first before he could fire him. And then he uh, lost. Can I ask a question? What? The, you just said state senate. No, it's was, U.S. Senate. Okay. okay. If I said state, I didn't mean to say state. Yeah, it was, you did. It was, uh, yeah. No, it, it was, well, the Louisiana Senate race, meaning the he was running right. as a senator for the United States from Louisiana. Right. Yeah. So, um, Ethan Bustani did sue Ethan Brown and his publisher for defamation over allegations made in his book, Murder in the Bayou. However, after he lost that race, he dropped his lawsuit and did come out and say, well, he did visit the Boudreaux in one time uh, because he hosted a town hall meeting there, but he never, ever went back. He, he had a town hall meeting at the Boudreaux Inn? That's exactly my thought. (laughs) Okay. Is it like no sexes today at the, at the Boudreaux (laughs) Inn? No sex, no drugs today. We're having a town hall meeting. We're having a town hall. Okay. All righty then. Yeah. I found that quite impressive that he would say, well, we had a town hall meeting there. Yeah. Uh, this place, only- this place, this place where drug dealers, uh, prostitutes and gambling takes place. We're come on down. We're having a, we're having a town hall. And as if anyone from the other side of town would have gone to that side of town for a town hall meeting. Right, I think we I think we mentioned in part one that Jennings, the city of Jennings, is split by a railroad track, and there's the poor side is on the south side, and the rich side is on the north side, and they didn't really mingle all that much. Yes, correct. But whether he did, you know, whether he was involved in any of this or not, the whole thing suggests that. Outside of the sheriff's office, there's another level of power that's involved with these murders, with this whole thing. Yeah, corruption. Yeah, and the the investigation's still stagnant. Someone is putting the brakes on, and they have the power to do it. And, you know, I don't think there's a lot of people that have that kind of power. Well, maybe people running for U.S. Senate do. Um, now, we talked at the beginning of, of this podcast about Bucky and Tanny, the retired state troopers, they again requested a private meeting with the sheriff again. They said they had some new info, and they were very excited about what they had found. And they left messages for Sheriff Woods, and he said he would get back to him in a few days, and two or three months later, they still had never heard from him. I'm shocked. You know? I'm, I'm as shocked as I sound. Yes. Sheriff Woods never responded to to any anyone for comment. You know, the other sheriff never responded for comments. All they say is the cases are active. Well, they're not very active because the, you know, they know they have they've had all these people, they've had witnesses, they've had people come forward. They've had people give them information. It goes nowhere. And what when they get good information, they bury it. Well, and I don't want to I don't want to overlook we we because we were talking about her before we started recording the podcast. The lady that how long ago has it been since she's died? That was Sheila Como, twenty three years ago. Sheila Como, okay, yeah. I, I don't want her because because we we, we call it the Jeff Davis eight, but it it very well could be the Jeff Davis nine. She very and that's well just could, the women. Yeah, and that's just yeah. But I'm just saying I don't want to. I kind of don't want to leave her out of it because. I agree. The, the circumstances surrounding her death are just, you know, very similar to the rest to the rest of these girls, and so I think I really think she should be included. 
I think so too. I mean, there's her and then there's been some men that have died that clearly knew stuff. So right. you know, it just goes on. Um, as far as Frankie Richard, he died March the 22nd, 2020. What's interesting about him is that he kind of went into hiding, um, I guess, from being harassed or I don't know. You don't know about him because he keep, kept his mouth shut and he knew a lot. Uh, he contacted a guy, H.L. Arledge, who is a big true crime guy. He wrote Bayou Justice, which is about uh, Southeast Louisiana cold case files. So okay. he, he wanted um, this guy. T- he was going to do a tell-all book about the Jeff Davis 8. And he talked to him and asked him, would he meet him? And the guy said, yeah, he would do it. He would write the book for him. And if he told him the story, he would do it. And uh, the next, next time he, they talked um, or were supposed to talk, Frankie Richard had died. Now, he died of uh, natural causes. He had gotten some bad um, tainted heroin because he had been running his mouth about this guy going to write a book. For he him. didn't die from the tainted heroin? No. Okay. How did he? How did he know it was tainted heroin? Just because he overdosed. Oh, he overdosed. Okay, he overdosed of the from the, hair, <clears throat> from the heroin. Okay, gotcha. And, yeah, and they all they knew that it was you know I guess when you do that much you you know when it's <laughs> I guess you know it's bad. I don't well, know. I'm I, guessing that when you're on when you're a heroin addict, you shoot a certain amount of heroin into your veins every day, and you don't overdose. And when you shoot the same exact amount into your veins and then you overdose, you can probably figure out that that heroin may have been dosed with f- extra fentanyl. Yeah, you, you know, you see what I'm saying? Like, it, you could probably, it's kind of like any other drug where it's like, you know what your limit is. And, and, and if you overdose, it's probably because of something. Yeah, I'm sure that you could tell. Uh, as much as he did, as he would know exactly, you know, and, and his fam, you know, the people he was with would know. Right. You know, those those people know. I mean, I wouldn't know. You wouldn't know. But right, these right. people do. I, that's just my thoughts off the top of my head. It's just I'm thinking if you're going to, you know, the reason you're going to overdose is it's probably going to be because because if you're because uh, he was a daily drug user, he was he was shooting up every day. And if you actually get to the point where you overdose it's probably because there's too much i'm guessing because there's too much fentanyl in it now could it be because there's too much fentanyl in it because that just happens sometimes just look or look around you every day i mean especially you know, here in ohio we got people dropping dead every day because of too much fentanyl in the in the heroin but it could be because somebody was trying to kill you as well right well like he said 14 is when he started doing pills and weed and i mean this this is his whole life you know yeah that's what that's that's my whole point is that he he was doing this every day every day every day every day every day and then all of a sudden he drops dead and or he he overdoses and he's like wait a minute so yeah Yeah. he he something 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 was up with that yeah Uh, and the case is I guess the cases are still um, what they consider active. I mean, <laughs> yeah, I have very little confidence that any of these murders will be solved. That any of these people will be brought to justice. Uh, I don't know. The only thing I found was from July the eighth of twenty twenty, the New Orleans nonprofit organization that advocates for criminal justice reform called the federal government to open a civil rights investigation into the Jeff Davis Sheriff's Office, uh, citing long history of misconduct. And they had um, cataloged decades of corruption from deputies dealing drugs to trafficking female inmates for sex. Uh, A Justice Department spokeswoman said the department received a letter and is, quote, considering the information provided, quote. Uh, among the claims um, is that the jailers in Jeff Davis Parish regularly trafficked female inmates for sex. Uh, the Associated Press 
citing state and FBI records reported in 2019 at least half a dozen women. This is in 2019. Right. At least half a dozen women told authorities that deputies raped and trafficked them to male inmates inside the jail. This has been going on two decades, and it's still going on. Now, one of the sheriffs that um, Ricky Edwards, he's working for Louisiana Sheriff's Association. Now, he's the sheriff. He was, yeah, he was the sheriff during He the was a sheriff, so he's still working in law enforcement. At the Louisiana Sheriff's Association, which is one of the most powerful lobbying groups in Louisiana. Okay. Now, I tried to find out. We great. Yeah. (laughs) And Terry Gilry is still working for a police department in Welch, which is very close to Jennings. Welch is in Louisiana? Yes. Can I ask you a question? What do you, do you think that guy should be anywhere near a badge and a gun? I don't think he should be anywhere near anybody. Yeah. God, be, you know, it just turns my stomach. It does. It, I don't know. I don't, I don't understand. You know, is it, is it an above the law thing? I don't understand. It's just, I don't know. I don't know, but I, it, I'm, I'm actually upset at this point. I can't believe that that sheriff and that other idiot still are involved in law enforcement in any capacity, fashion whatsoever. Somebody. It's somebody has kept has been able to keep them in a, in their jobs. Somebody's kept this from being found out. Somebody's kept this. I mean, it's like everybody knows, but they're not allowed to do anything about it. It just sounds political. Who who else has that kind of power? I, I don't know. I mean, we have some of that in Ohio as well. I mean, we have some. I mean, I'm sure every state does, but. Some crappy sheriffs, and because so, sheriffs are elected, they're not appointed. So, you know, depending on who elects you, sheriff, it, yeah. could, it could it could go south. Uh, but appointees can go south. They all can go south. It, a law enforcement official going south is not unheard of in any capacity whatsoever. But these guys seem to, they're just untouchable. It's like they run this little area of Louisiana with impunity. They pass laws that where you can take stuff out of people's cars and they're murdering women and they don't get investigated. And it, it's just a nightmare. And it just goes evidently so far up. I mean, it's like, yeah, it goes up. Hey, how high up does this go and where, where, how high? I don't know. It's taxpayers pay these people salaries. And the higher up it goes, we're paying them. So look the other way. It's it's maddening. It makes you want to go sleep with your cousin. It's craziness. (laughs) Craziness. (laughs) Maybe that's what they did. I don't know. It's craziness. So what's the... Moral to the story. Do you have one? Do we have one? Don't go to Jennings. Don't go to Jennings. Yeah, I agree. Don't go to Jennings. Is That's first rule of thumb. I think if there's a moral, it's power corrupts. Absolute power corrupts. Absolutely. Oh, um, definitely. Yeah. I, I, these people are... They've never been held to account. There are eight dead women. There are families. They have loved ones that care about them, that love them, that didn't deserve this. And I, I that's who I feel bad about. I looked at some of these families now on Facebook. You know, these are real families. This isn't like, oh, okay, this was a, a bad person and they got murdered because of what they knew. Oh, well. No, these are people, these people, women had, had families and someone, and yeah, did they have, did they pick a bad way to live for whatever reason? Yeah, you don't know what these women went through. You don't know what their stories are and you won't because they're dead because of what they knew. Did they deserve to die just because of what they knew? No. 
and their families go through every single day. I mean, one of these girls was 17. They were between 17 and 30 years old. And their families loved them. Absolutely. And they had kids that will, you know, grow up without them. You know, sometimes when you're doing a podcast, you might have to use Wikipedia as a resource. I don't give a shit if you read straight down a Wikipedia page. If you're trying to bring attention to victims and victims' families, then you're doing the right thing. That's pretty much all we have. Th these murders have never been solved. If you have any information about these murders, any of these victims, any of these murders, do not contact the Jeff Davis Sheriff's Office. Contact the FBI. You you won't nothing will happen if you call the Jeff the Jefferson Davis uh, Sheriff's Office. So don't don't bother doing that because in my opinion, they're involved. So don't do that. Uh, I want to thank, thank you again, Tex, for joining me. Thanks. Yes. Thank you all for listening to the podcast. We really do appreciate it. And like I said before, the whole point of this podcast is to get these stories out, to get the victim stories out. Uh, it doesn't matter how you get it out per se just as, as long as you're telling it. I thought this was a really interesting story that needed to be told. It needed to be, it's been told, but as much as it can be told, I think it should be told because I think as many people that can hear it, uh, I think that's really important. I want to thank everyone for listening. Uh, if you could go ahead and please hit that subscribe and like button. Thanks for listening. Peace, love, and stay groovy, guys.